Hi, welcome to uh, um, Tater Talk on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, that's, that's quite a mouthful to say. Um, Andy asked me here to talk about uh, PBY spread a little bit. Um, you've heard Kent say there, he's given you some pretty good news about, about uh, North Dakota. Um, Minnesota's numbers are fairly similar, I understand. So we had a good year for PBY. In other words, fairly, relatively low um, of PBY infections this year, not a lot of rejections. That's good. And um, it really does kind of underscore the fact that, that, you know, a lot of it sometimes is, is dependent on the vectors. We had a very low vector year this year until late in the season, uh, but it also means that we're doing some things correctly. And that's, that's always good. Um, but let's face it, you know, if you ask me to talk about PBY, you all know I'm an entomologist. You all know I love things with six legs and you know what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about the vectors. So today I'm gonna to give you a little bit of background on PBY again, just to refresh your memories a little bit. But I'm also going to talk about some of the information that we have now on what regional vector populations are doing and how things are changing a little bit with our interpretation and what that data, what the, those data can actually tell us and inform us for management purposes. So I'm going to talk a lot about aphids today. Uh, and we all love aphids so much, I know. Uh, our PBY epidemic here is part of a larger pandemic, just like COVID, really. Okay, globally, potato virus Y is the most important virus of seed potatoes. It's a problem in every seed growing location in the world that I know of. Um, but we're also, we're also getting a pretty good handle on how this epidemic works. We're getting a pretty good handle on improving some of our management options, starting with clean seed, controlling vectors, a lot of the stuff we've done for a long time. Also minimizing mechanical transmission, which we're now realizing is, is uh, a, a, maybe a larger problem than we originally thought. Um, but there are still some issues that make management a little difficult. We've got new strains that are becoming more and making up more and more of the virus that's present in, in our regions. And a lot of things like, well, PBY Wilga, which is becoming probably the major virus that we, strain of virus that we're seeing certainly in Minnesota and, and in the area, North Dakota as well. And so these things are harder to see. They're harder to pick up when you're scouting for, uh, uh, for PVY. So they're harder to rogue, but just as importantly, or maybe even more importantly, they're actually easier, easier for, the, for the vectors to spread. So these are easier to transmit than those other vectors. So PVYO is you know, not, very, not, uh, not very numerous anymore. Most of the, the uh, infections are PVY Wilga for the last couple of years, but the reason for that is the aphids themselves, the vectors themselves, are transmitting these new varieties more easily than some of the older ones. PBY is a non-persistent virus. Most of you know all this, it's just reminders. Uh, by non-persistent, they're talking about in the vector, not in the plant. So a persistent virus, after an insect uh, acquires it and sucks it up in the sap, it's got to go across the gut membrane and build numbers and finally get to the salivary glands of the insect before it can transmit it. So for potato leaf roll virus, which is a persistent virus, it could be up to three days before an aphid actually picks up that virus and is able to transmit it to a non-infected plant. That's a good time. It's a good time period. Consequently, we can control this potato, we can control uh, uh, persistent viruses with traditional insecticides, ones that cause mortality, neurotoxins like pyrethroids and neonics and things like that, that are, are targeted at killing the insect, but might take a little longer to do. It might take 24, 48 hours to kill an insect that way with, once they're exposed. And so a non-persistent virus, it takes so long to get to the point where it can be transmitted again, you may be able to control that spread. And, or sorry, a persistent virus. A non-persistent virus though, that's one that an insect can pick up in seconds and transmit in seconds. Now with PVY, an aphid actually, you know, some of the times say less than a minute, but even the, the long periods are five to 10 minutes of feeding will allow them to pick up uh, PVY. And in fact, the time that takes for this, for uh, an aphid to pick up PVY virus really has a lot to do with how much virus is in the plant, how infected that plant is and what the virus concentration is. Once the virus uh, uh, is on the mouth parts of the aphid, it can now transmit that virus. It's what we call viroliferous at that point. It'll land on another uninfected plant. And once it probes, 
the virus particles get wiped off and now they're in the uninfected plant. The plant is now infected. So it's a very rapid process. Uh, the, some species are a lot more efficient at it than others. Some of them, the virus particles really stick well to the, to the, the mouth parts and they're easily transmitted. Some of them, as a matter of fact, like green peach aphid will remain infectious even after the next feeding. Um, most species though, once they've got these pieces of virus on their mouth parts, and they use those mouth parts to pierce into another plant, those, that virus, those virus particles get wiped off. And so once it's fed on an uninfected plant, transmitted the viruses, that aphid is clean. But it can pick up virus particles from an infected plant, a separate infected plant, very rapidly. So there's no limit to how often it can become infectious with a non-persistent virus. Because the transmission time is so short, it means that if you've got an insecticide that takes 24 hours to kill an insect, or even an hour to kill an insect, that's still long enough for that insect to transmit PVY. And consequently, we don't get really good PVY, you know, suppression of PVY transmission uh, PBY spread with traditional insecticides. There are some insecticides that work on feeding and stopping feeding and probing behavior, and those are a little different, but using the traditional insecticides, we just don't get great control. Um, vectors are, are the vectors, in other words, the little insects that are transmitting this disease. Those vectors are principally winged aphids, and they're moving from plant to plant. And winged aphids are different than the aphids you find on plants, which are non-winged. You're gonna find two morphs out there, Winged aphids and non-winged aphids. You'll find the winged aphids are a little larger. These are green peach aphids. These are the bad girls right here. And a little bit of, of information on life history. Through the summer, there are no male aphids. You know, I've always told that story. And if you want to make a buck and bet somebody a buck, you can tell what species of aphid, what sex of aphids you hold up and go, oh, that's a female. You know, they're all females. So just an old entomology trick. Don't ever take that bet from me. So there's no males out there. They're all females. They also don't lay eggs. They, they give birth to live daughters and they're basically born pregnant. So it's all a cloning thing. They're basically putting off the same genotype as the mother has itself. There's no eggs. And this is one of the reasons why aphid populations can expand so rapidly. Now, winged aphids, they live a different life than, than non-winged aphids. They have a different job. A winged aphid, her job is to disperse, go to a new plant and found a new colony. Uh, in the springtime, the way these things overwinter is usually the overwinter is eggs on plants. So in springtime, those eggs hatch. They're all female aphids. They're not winged. And they'll feed on the plant for a little while. And then after a couple of generations, you get a whole generation of winged aphids. And they leave that overwintering plant and they go to the summer hosts. Most of the time, those are different species. When they get to the summer host, a winged aphid will fly into a field. It'll see the, the summer host. It may be attracted because of reflectance or any one of a number of things. It'll land. And the first thing it does is it probes the plant. And the reason it probes the plant is it because it wants to taste the plant and find out, is this a suitable host? If I leave a daughter here, is she going to survive? If it is a suitable host, that's exactly what she does. She deposits one or two daughters and flies off to a nearby plant, another plant to test that one. That daughter is always going to be wingless. Because a, wing, because a wingless aphid, a non-winged aphid, their job is to build the colony. And so they're not interested in dispersing, they're interested in feeding and taking that energy and turning it into growth and reproduction. And so if, it, if a winged aphid gave birth to a winged aphid, it wouldn't found a colony, it would start flying off itself. So a winged aphid always gives birth to a non-winged aphid, a colony builder. If that winged aphid lands on that plant and probes it and decides this is not a good host, it just leaves. It'll fly off to a nearby plant. And the interesting thing is, I have never met an aphid that has a degree in agronomy or any experience in farming at all. So they don't understand monocrops in the least. They land on a potato plant in a potato field, they'll taste it, they'll say, you know, if it's not, if it's a soybean aphid or something, go, oh. This is not a host, I'm not gonna leave a daughter here. And it flies maybe a meter or two meters at most and lands on another potato plant and goes, I wonder if this is a host and probes it. So they, they don't really have that thinking ability. You're never gonna see an insect shaking the king of Sweden's hand saying, thanks for the Nobel prize. It's not gonna happen. 
And so, you know, they're, they're operating on hardwire behavior and they're just going to hop plant to plant to plant all the way through, um, all the way through a, uh, uh, a field, leaving daughters if it's a suitable host and not if it isn't. There's another factor we have to think of, and that's what species of aphid has entered our field. Some of them are going to be moving in. Some of them are just passing through. The ones that are moving in are colonizing aphids. They're going to leave a daughter. She's going to start feeding and leave, you know, leave a bunch of, of individuals. And those are the ones you're going to find little colonies of on those bottom leaves when you're out scouting for aphids. The other ones, those are uh, non-colonizing aphids like soybean aphids, cereal aphids. Um, those ones are actually going to fly in, probe, not a host, move on to another one. So those are the ones that'll fly their way through an entire field. Here's the thing, if they're picking up, if there's any inoculum in that field and you have an in-flight of one of these non-colonizing hosts, they're gonna move that inoculum around because they're gonna be probing, picking up virus, going, yep, not a host, fly over two or three meters, probe another plant, oh, not a host, it's just deposited any virus it picked up. So as they move through, they can be a big problem. In fact, the non-colonizing aphids can be as big a contributor to the epidemic, if not bigger than the colonizing aphids will. So inoculum is going to get moved around by these individuals. Um, it's just one of the other things that we have to think about. The non-colonizing individuals is one of the reasons, especially things like serial aphids, is another reason why we started this, the, the aphid alert, you know, years ago in the 1990s, and we started it up again in, in 2012. Um, this was actually to, just to look at whatever was flying into the to fields. And we've got about 20 traps set up between North Dakota and Minnesota. Uh, and uh, we have grower cooperators who do it, and many of you who are, are watching. And I really have to thank the grower cooperators. Without them, this project is not possible period. Um, these cooperators will, uh, they go out and they change the trap jar, they seal it up, they mail it to us, and we sort through the bug soup, pick out all the aphids, and then we identify all of the aphids that are going to, are capable of vectoring PVY. We also calculate something called a PVY vector risk index, and that's so we can standardize results across, uh, across all of the species of aphids that we're counting, and figure out what the actual risk of transmitting PVY is based on the numbers of those aphids. The reason for this is not all aphids are created equal when it comes to transmitting PVY. I've already mentioned that a little bit. And some are not very efficient, but still will move PVY around if there's enough of them in a field. Others like green peach aphid, if they're in a field and there's an oculum, they're going to move it around. So um, if you think about risk, well, hazard is the innate danger of something, you know, uh, because of a characteristic of something. And risk is hazard times exposure. So aphids have the biological ability to transmit PVY virus, that's hazard. But if they're actually present in an area and they have the opportunity to transmit PVY, that's risk. And so we wanted to talk about what's the chances of, of these aphids, these particular aphids that you've got coming into an area what's the chances they will vector PBY? So to calculate out this risk index, what we do is we look at how many aphids of a particular species they are. And then from the literature, we get how efficient a vector are they compared to green peach aphid? Because that's what everybody does. When they look at vector efficiency, they compare everything to green peach aphid because it's the benchmark. They're, it's the most e efficient vector there is. So what we're doing is if we have a species that's maybe one tenth as efficient as PBY, and we've read that in the literature, uh, what we'll do is we'll say, okay, we got 10 of them. That's the equivalent of having one green peach aphid. So you can think of the vector risk index as everything in the terms of green peach aphid, if you want to think about it that way. So that's why we do this. So we can actually look and, and calculate how bad things are, or not how bad they are, what the potential risk is. Um, because we've been doing this now for nine years, uh, 2012 through 2020 inclusive, um, we're able to now start looking at regional patterns. Now, we don't have a full nine years from all sites, but we do have enough from most of these sites that we can, multi-years, that we can start to think about what our, uh, our regional patterns are going to be like. So um, even though individual locations in a particular year might not mirror the regional pattern, 
Uh, we're actually going to be addressing that. We'll be developing these local patterns based on kind of clustering some of these sites together. We'll make that stuff, uh, we'll make that information available on the website. And the reason we're thinking this might be really useful to producers is it gives us a lot of uh, information on timing our management. For example, it tells us when we're at the greatest risk in our area, we tell when the best time to scout and, and best time to use different scouting tactics, when to be really vigilant about management, when to think about specific tactics. And I'll talk about each one of these as we go along. Well, if you look at that average data from 2012 all the way through 2020, um, and you look at when we've been capturing aphids and the total number, this is just the total vector capture averaged per week across all traps for that entire nine years. And what we find is our aphid numbers, our aphid vector numbers don't really start to rise until about the middle of July. Now these dates that we've got down here, these just the numbered of the dates, these are ISO weeks so that we can compare across years. It's a way of standardizing the time. And what we see is we have our, our populations start to rise in July, peak in August, and then they dip down to September. Now we don't have as, uh, as much data for September as we do for June, July, and August, and, but that's okay. Because by that time, most of the producers have started to vine kill. Vine kill is probably well on its way. And so we're less concerned about what, whether the vectors are out there because there's nothing to transmit PVY to, hopefully. So uh, we'll probably look at that as, as time goes by. But for now, we're happy with, with knowing when we're getting our greatest number of PVY vectors. Well, not only do we have the vector numbers, but we know what species they are. So we've been able to calculate what's the risk over those times? What's our average risk over a season? And that's a little different. And it probably is related to the different species presence at different times. So again, starts to rise in July, it peaks in early August, you see a little slough, and then it peaks again in the end of August, and then it just dips down. That's probably because of the different species. End of July, early August is typically when we get our big flights of cereal aphids. And some of those are very effective vectors. And so we get a little peak early August, and then later in the year, that's when we're going to start seeing stuff come off of maybe some other crops that are starting to senesce, maybe canola, some of those other things. And so we get a peak then as well. Our um, amount of, of, I'll talk about the cumulative PBY risk in a, in a moment because it ties into something else I'm going to talk about. Well, the usefulness of this data, of looking at when we're actually getting some risk and when we're seeing our peak risk, means that we can now start to apply it to some of our management tactics. For example, the new tactic that uh, is coming out of uh, work that's being done in, in New Brunswick indicates that adding insecticide, specifically lambda cyhalothrin, the active ingredient that's in, in uh, Warrior and Silencer, um, and um, adding that or belief or fulfill the two anti-feeding insecticides. If you add those to a foil and you, you do that uh, application of that, uh, of that tank mix once a week, you're going to get as good or better suppression of PVY than applying just AFOIL alone twice a week. That's what their data says. You know, I can't recommend it, but that's what their data says. Uh, I haven't done this data. I haven't done this, this trial. We are doing it uh, this, this summer. Uh, they, they do recommend uh, weekly, aphid, uh, weekly AFOIL treatments and adding insecticide in five times a year. And they, do, they say two in the early season, one in mid-season, two in the late season. That might not be the best fit for us though. The reason I say that is if you look at when those aphid populations are around in New Brunswick, they're starting to see their peak in late June, early July. And then their aphid populations peak in July and then start decreasing through August. Their season um, starts, a, well, their aphid season starts a little earlier than ours does out here on the, on the Northern Plains. So, if you look at ours, again, our PBY risk index, the, when we're actually seeing a lot of transmission, that's gonna peak in August. Uh, our numbers start to rise pretty significantly in July, but they peak in August. So we may wanna start thinking, if you're going to follow that tactic, you're going to do that, you're going to add insecticide to your AFOIL, you may wanna give a thought to when you wanna do it. Maybe you wanna do one early season because we do see, we do see risk in June, but maybe you want to back end load that tactic. That's gonna be something you have to decide. We'll have better insights to that as we get that regional data move worked out as well, that local data worked out as well. 
Mechanical transmission. One of the other things that, that the New Brunswick uh, group came up with was they were able to demonstrate that PBY spread in tractor lanes, tractor uh, rows, was much, much higher than we initially thought. And so again, because we know when we're starting to see our, our PBY risk, maybe if it's possible, you can look at uh, when you want to minimize uh, being in the field. It may not be possible all the time. Or, you know, we've got fungicide to put on, but there may be ways of ameliorating that the mechanical risk as well. So again, a lot of this is related to when we're getting our, our, our PBY risk. And if you look at the accumulation, how that, that risk accumulates over the season, again, it does mirror when we're seeing stuff. We do have risk building through June, but it really takes off into an exponential rise in July and then starts to plateau middle of August out into September. It's when we start to see a little decrease and the risk starts to not add in as much. What this means is maybe we wanna think about when we're increasing our, our PBY spread the most and maybe concentrating our efforts, maybe targeting some of that, that temporally. I'm not saying again, you can't ignore that early season or the late season, but it does mean when we're seeing that big rise might deserve more attention. It also may be when, say, we start to adopt some of these different scouting techniques, which might be a little bit more expensive, like remote sensing or ELISA sticks. A lot of these things might be adopted in the near future. Maybe the best timing for those is not, you know, early. Maybe we might want to, if we wanted to, if you're like me, and you've got Scottish heritage, and you're a little parsimonious, maybe you want to focus some of those more expensive methods in a particular time where you're going to see a biggest return. But again, I wouldn't necessarily go ahead and recommend these right now, these tactics right now, wait until we have some of that local data worked out so you have a better idea of when things are happening. But it is worthwhile thinking about and it is worthwhile planning for in the future. So I'm probably over time or at time. Uh, I will be around for questions. So please ask if you've got questions. Thank you.